Well, welcome to Vote 2020 Beyond the Podium. We're uh, very lucky to be joined by Representative Tina Polsky, currently representing the State House in District uh, 81, but she's running for State Senate District uh, 29. Representative Polsky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So for the first thing, most people know that when you make the move from State House to State Senate, you're going to be representing more people. But other than that, how is the day-to-day -day different in the State House and the State Senate? Sure. Day-to-day, uh, -day, I don't think it's so different, except, as you said, the sheer size. It's three times the size, about 450,000 constituents. Um, the big difference for me, uh, in the, there's two things in the district as well as then when you go to Tallahassee, but in the district, I would potentially be representing a lot more cities than I do now. So that would require a lot more uh, time with different city councils and commissions than I currently do now. I happen to represent mostly unincorporated Palm Beach County and the three cities in the Glades. So I work with them, but other than that, it's just dealing with Palm Beach County. So that would be a big change for me is the city of Wellington, Parkland, Coconut Creek, the city of Boca. Um, and so uh, it would certainly require a lot more time and you do have three times as many constituents. Um, in Tallahassee, the Senate chamber, uh, you know, there's only 40. So you, you, each individual center, I think, has a lot more weight and pull. Each vote really matters. There's just a, a handful of people on a committee. So you can really make a difference. You have unlimited bill slots. So you can really work on so many different areas that interest you and that would help your district. And the, from what I understand, the nature of the Senate is just a lot more bipartisan. You have a greater opportunity to have your legislation heard than I think you do in the House, which is tends to just be a little more difficult in the minority party. Sounds like a lot more work. <laughs> I think it will be, but you do get an extra staff person. <laughs> oh, well, that is good. Uh, what made you first decide that you wanted to you know, represent people in South Florida? Well, going back about three years and the first time that I ever ran for political office, it all started, I'd say, in 2016 with a general, um, you know, bad feelings about what was going on in our country. I became much more involved in politics and, uh, you know, started to become more aware of what was going on in the state. Um, and was pretty frustrated, you know, as a Democrat, what was going on. Uh, I was pretty vocal out there. I've been involved in community activities, charitable activities, and, you know, people in this area knew me, and I was approached to run for an open state house seat, which I really had never contemplated before. And, you know, thinking about it, meeting with people, discussing it, it just seemed like a really good fit for me with my background as a lawyer and a mediator. My children were getting you know, much older and more self-sufficient. And as I said, I really had this like political angst that I needed to find a good outlet for. And so when the opportunity came up and we looked at it and we thought I would be you know, a good candidate, then uh, kind of plunged right in. So um, that was my first race uh, that I ever had and I you know, was lucky to win it. And um, now I'm in my second race, but you know, good to have two years of house experience behind me. Put that into words, what uh, you looking around in 2016 and not being happy with what you were seeing in the political climate. Get more specific. What do you mean by that? Well, I was very unhappy with the election of President Trump. Um, not uh, my choice for that. And just kind of the ensuing political climate that has come since. Um, I actually, one of the reasons I wanted to run among many, but uh, one that really stood out for me was uh, our gun violence problem. And this was 2000, the end of 2017. So Parkland had not happened. And um, I was very frustrated, I think, post Sandy Hook, that things really weren't changing. And so I was looking at the states and saying, you know, well, some states like Connecticut were, were doing some, some good um, gun violence programs. But the fact that we couldn't get anything done in Florida was really frustrating. And so it seemed to me the federal government wasn't doing what I think it should be doing. And so you have to look to the states. And here I am living in a state that is so dominated by the Republican Party that you can't get anything done on that score. So I start running officially January 2018. And we all know what happened February 14th, 2018, here in our area. And so, you know, that just motivated even me, even more to 
keep going and, and fight for what I believe in. Um, I became very involved with Moms Demand Action, a really great group. The one in Boca actually formed right after um, the Parkland tragedy. And they've been amazing to work with, really supportive. Um, so just really trying to get out there on that issue. And that's just one example of how I think, you know, we've gone down the wrong path um, and we're just not fixing the problems that we have. And so that's just one area. I think there's also been a lot of, you know, kind of going backwards as far as women's rights, abortion access, um, voter voting rights, just things that make me really uncomfortable. And I don't like the direction that the federal government was going in. And I thought that our state was following. So that is, you know, what motivated me to, you know, I said, I'm a smart, thoughtful uh, woman who had never been involved before. And that's why there was kind of this spate of uh, women running in for the 2018 um, you know, congressional races and then state races like myself. Matt, if I could jump in just very quickly, mm -hmm. Representative Polsky, when you talk about current Florida gun laws, that a uh, wave of gun legislation that came out after Parkland very much pushed forward by those Parkland parents, do you think the state needs stricter gun control legislation? And what does that look like to you? I do. I absolutely do. Um, it, it was a good step forward, especially in a state like ours, and I'm very glad they took it. That was before my time in office. But I think there's so much more that we could do. I would love to see a ban on assault style weapons. We don't need military weapons in people's hands. Um, that is what the young man in Kenosha used to mow down uh, two innocent people. Um, that's what was used in the Parkland tragedy. And so I just don't understand why any individual needs a gun like that. Personally, what I've worked on the last two years um, that I have proposed legislation and will continue to do so as long as I am in elected office is on safer storage of guns. And we have a decent law on the books if you look at it, but the problem is it is never prosecuted, it has no teeth, and it just doesn't work. Just two weeks ago, I believe, in Florida, a young man, a 13 man, a boy, a 13 year old brought three guns to school and the mother didn't lock the safe or something like that. In Kenosha, the mother gave the son her gun. That's illegal. And that is not safe storage of guns. And every gun owner that I've spoken to says they don't mind having whatever safety standards are required to make sure that they are responsible gun owners. So every gun should be locked up in a safe or with a trigger lock. So you are the only person who can access it. And it's not just with children in the home. It's I was going to say, one of those sounds very feasible. The other one doesn't. Right. When you talk about safe storage, a lot of people can get behind that. When mm -hmm. you talk about an assault weapons ban, uh, does that have traction in, in a place like Tallahassee? Probably not, if I'm being honest, it doesn't. But that's why I personally chose safer storage. I feel like you, like, what's the harm? I mean, we, you know, agree to seatbelts in the cars. We just agreed to no texting in the cars. This is along the same lines as trying to monitor proper behavior. Um, so I thought this was a no brainer, but of course I did not get a hearing um, in the last two sessions. So I will continue to fight for that. Um, you know, I've been tweaking my legislation to see what we can do to make it stick. Um, and I will continue to fight for it. It is just a no brainer. So I do, there are examples almost every day of terrible situations where a young person gets a gun. But what I was going to say before is it's not just even a young person. Think about a young adult suicide, a 21 year old who in a mo terrible moment finds an easy access to a gun and then it's too late. If that moment passed, then there are studies that show they may never feel suicidal again. But once a gun gets involved in a situation, it's too late. In domestic violence situations, a woman is five times more likely to die when there is a gun in, in the home. So for not just for toddlers, but of course we hear toddlers or children, we hear about that all the time where they grab a gun and they shoot their mother, they shoot their brother, they shoot their friend. It is just the most preventable tragedy. So I know we can do more and I will continue to fight for it. So I think that there's a combination. There must've been 20 different laws that Democrats proposed in the last couple of sessions on various places you can't have guns, restrictions on guns, uh, stricter background checks that most gun owners approve of, the majority of Americans approve of. Florida's just not following the lead of uh, the American people and what they want with respect to gun violence laws. To my friend, Matt Lincoln, we go. 
you know, uh, Representative Polsky, you know, I know that you uh, practice law in New York before coming to South Florida uh, 15 years ago. You did your uh, undergrad at UPenn. I don't know if you know this, but your competitor in the race did his grad work uh, at UPenn. Can you give us a good uh, uh, college story about what uh, life was like going to college in Philadelphia? Very different than uh, it is now. Um, a good college story. Um, you know, it's interesting because I went back to visit the school with my daughter, who is now in college. She doesn't go there, but we visited and boy, has it uh, been gentrified and cleaned up West Philadelphia, where I lived. Um, it was, um, you know, was good college time. stories don't often start with gentrification. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm, t I'm, I'm not telling those kinds of college <laughs> I'm actually such a nerd. You know, people, people always say to me like, oh, skeletons in the closet. I'm like there are none. I'm really a nerd. I studied, I did my work, um, you know, got pretty good grades at uh, UPenn, went on to law school um, at Columbia. So I worked pretty hard um, there, but um you know, can't, can't say there was, a, you know, a great college story I can think of. I worked a little bit for the newspaper. Um, I studied international relations. I went to Paris for a semester. It was a phenomenal experience. Um, you know, I minored in French. Can't remember too much of it, but that was a great experience. So it was, um, it was a phenomenal experience all around. I really loved Penn and I uh, did take my daughter there, hoping that would be a good school for her. It was not. I don't think she would have gotten in, but that's okay. Um, so, um, you know, really loved my experience there. I think it's a phenomenal school. I, from hearing when you talk about college and you, we even got a sense of it when we talked about gun legislation, sounds like you're a very big policy person. And from what I know about you, I, I know that as well. And it usually is tough for those kinds of politicians when they are in a bruising primary fight like the kind you were in. Do you think that that hurt you as a candidate, wounded you as a candidate going into the general? You mean how contentious the primary was? Yeah, in um, terms of the attacks back and yeah. forth, it obviously dragged records out. Right, I actually don't because there was nothing in that primary that was truly negative to me in terms of my record. Um, it was, you know, just, attacks, but there was nothing substantive to it. Um, even when my opponent had said that I, I didn't pass legislation or I didn't bring any money back, it was just a pure lie. As I said in the debate or somewhere, you know, just take 10 minutes to look at my record on uh, floridahouse.gov and you can see the bill that I passed, other bills that I worked on, as well as the appropriations that I brought back to the districts. So, um, I just don't think any of that stuck. Um, the name calling, whatever. I've spoken to so many constituents who were just horrified at the ads. And so I don't think it's a problem because it was really, to me, his record that was um, out there. And, and there was you know, nothing that he brought up that had to do with my constituent services, uh, the way I voted in Tallahassee, the way I've handled myself at, in my life or as a, you know, a, a, a house member. So I'm really not concerned about it. On the flip side though, he gave me some great name ID and I was pretty much on TV every day because he called me out and he spent a lot of money out there. Um, I did too, but his was a lot more than mine. And so I feel very strong going into this general election with name ID and what we did during the primary, um, getting 69% of the vote was really, really positive. And so I feel very strongly about that. Um, a lot of my friends and colleagues are independents or Republicans, and I feel very strongly that they will uh, be able to vote for me in the general, as well as, of course, the Democrats. So feeling good going into November. So we spoke with your competitor uh, a couple days ago. And one of the things that he's running on, or at least what he said to us, was that he's running on bipartisan cooperation. He's running on trying to take some of the tension out of the air in Tallahassee, right? How do you run against someone like that where there's not a record to attack because they haven't been in public office? They're preaching something that is generally agreed upon that we should be more bipartisan. I mean, how does one mount a campaign against that kind of, a, a, of an opponent? Sure. Well, there's nothing about me that's not interested in bipartisanship as well. Um, if you look at my record and bills that I have co-sponsored, um, been the prime co-sponsor, my own personal bills have been 
co-sponsored by Republicans. I have many friends across the aisle. I think my, my biggest strength, you mentioned policy and you know hard work and intelligence, but um, my relationships with people is really what helps me the most in Tallahassee. And I have many friends across the aisle. I just know how to get along. And that's how I got appropriations passed. As you know, we don't control any of the budget committees. And so the fact that a freshman Democrat was able to bring back money to the district, even after the vetoes of this past year, um, you know, show the kind of relationships that I have and, and the way I'm able to build uh, bridges. So I don't think that that is uh, his alone. And obviously he's just claiming it, I have done it. But more importantly than any of that, the way I run this campaign is that experience matters in this moment in time. Of course, at one point I was a newbie as well, but I was running for a house seat, not a Senate seat. Um, in the, um, as we talked about, the Senate is a lot more work and a lot more responsibility. So here I am with the House experience in the middle of a pandemic where we have worked so hard for our constituents and we are in the throes of every single problem that they have, the largest being unemployment crisis, but testing and food distribution and housing and every single problem that they might have is amplified by this pandemic. And so at this moment in time, it has never been more important to have experience going in to start the new session next year. And I have my, uh, you know, fingers in every area that we are dealing with. I'm ready to go with legislation that we need to fix the unemployment system. I have an incredible team already assembled that has experience and we are ready to go on day one to help take care of District 29. And I, I think it never mattered more than before. One of the things that I've noticed with the state's unemployment crisis is it's frequently falling to representatives, but a lot of state senators, Jason Pizzo, et cetera, et cetera, to get some kind of restitution for these people who have yet to be paid. Do you think that we have come through the state's unemployment issues? Are we just beginning with them? Where do we rest in that spectrum of where we are with our unemployment payment difficulties? I would say we're maybe 50% there. You know, we had hundreds of people who reached out to our office to help. And, you know, we, like you said, every state representative, every state senator has been dealing with this. And so, um, what Is it we- Is the governor's did, fault, do you think? I think that he plays a large role in it. There was an audit that was done a year ago, very pre-pandemic, and did nothing about it. They knew there were problems with it. And he had an opportunity. I think he dragged his feet at the beginning of the pandemic when we all knew this was happening because immediately people applied for unemployment and couldn't get through. And that was one of the things we asked for a special session. Uh, was it the beginning of April? I can't even remember now. And they all said no. Um, they just didn't want our help. And that just goes to show you. So yeah, he said, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. And he didn't. He said he didn't have the authority to raise the amount of money. I don't know about that. Um, I think that if there was an opportunity for an executive order, it was then at that moment in time. Um, at some point, he brought more people on to work on it, but they didn't know what they were doing, and they would just take the information or give wrong information. You still couldn't physically get onto the system. So what we did in our office and offices all across the state, what our aides did, who deserve all the credit in the world for everything that they did. Deal they became DEO agents dealing with these people every single day. We'd find tricks, we'd find tips, we'd send out emails. To, we'd keep a list of everyone who needed help. We'd say, oh, log on at 4 a.m., that's your best chance. Wait, switch to your phone. Wait, go back to your computer, try this portal, try this. There was a new thing every day that we tried to come up with and we had to teach ourselves how to do it. They added a second legislative um, aid, I guess, through DEO to take our information. They created a portal at some point, and then they logged all the information in. So we had a list of our people, every legislator did, and they would try to get answers for us. So we did make strides, and a lot of our people did get their money, but it's very difficult. We still have people who are fighting for a few weeks back in the beginning that didn't get it or who were rejected. There are people who have appeals going on. They were trying to upload information. The system still doesn't take it. Um, so it's still not there. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back and being able to work across the aisle because everyone knows this is an issue. It didn't affect one party or the other. And this is when I think we can make some strides. I really do. Um, I spoke to Rep Dane Eagle, who is now the new D, um, DEO head, and he is reaching out to all of us. Um, he wants our input. I think this is going to be one of those um, 
situations with our hands-on experience is going to help shape the future of what unemployment looks like. I hope, I mean, that is, I'm optimistic that this is something where we can really work together, where they will make a change, but you never know what's gonna happen. It may just be the same old story. When you, um, say, they, on, when you say they, are you referring to the Republicans? Leadership, yeah. Hmm. You know, I'd imagine getting ready to run a race against someone with no record is sort of like getting ready for a South Palm Beach County Women's Tennis League match against someone <laughs> that you don't know their game of. Can, can you know me tell well. me what kind of uh, player you're like? What kind of player are you like? Because I know you've uh, won you, plenty of matches there. You want to talk tennis. Um, uh, you, you'll be surprised here that I'm a thoughtful player. I'm a strategic player. Uh, my partner is like when I come up with... That's uh, such a surprise. I'm yeah. shocked by that. <laughs> and sometimes I'm, uh, I'm, I think better than I do, right? So, um, yeah, when it's time to do eye formation or Australian, you got to do it. Um, when I want to get my backhand down the line going, I make sure we figure out a way to do that. Um, so I do like to come up with strategies. I, I, I like, you know, if I have a problem in the first set, figuring out what we did wrong and doing better in the second set and then winning the whole thing. So I'm uber competitive. Um, I love to play. And um, I, you know, it, it's great exercise. It, it's great social. It's really nice to, you know, be outdoors. It was, it was not a small thing when I moved to Florida, thinking I'd be able to play more tennis. And I'm thrilled that I, I get to do that. I'm very lucky. As someone who is uber competitive, you have two uh, young kids of my own. We haven't really got to the situation where we're uh, playing sports yet, but I know uh, both uh, Rebecca and Jesse are both big athletes. So what kind of soccer mom are you? You one of those people <laughs> yelling from the sideline? Um, when my husband's not hitting me, be quiet, be quiet. Um, I try to control myself. It's hard. I mean, as you can imagine, when I see an injustice, it's hard for me not to speak out. So a ref makes a bad call or somebody, you know, hurts my kid. It's, it's hard. But I, I have learned to behave myself. Um, so Jesse now is uh, doing school soccer. Uh, he's done with the travel. So that makes me uh, less of a, uh, a spectator than I used to be. But I'm looking forward to going to his school games, hopefully. Uh, right now they're scheduled to play, so uh, it's not till the winter. So hopefully things are, are better. Um, my daughter played travel volleyball, so talk about going all over the country and dealing with that. And, and there you're really close, so you gotta keep your mouth shut. And that's a problem sometimes for me, but I try. Um, I try to be supportive. It's, it's tough. Any parent out there who is a sports parent knows it's hard to find that balance between supporting your kids, speaking out, and then being quiet enough and showing them the support on the ride home that they need, um, making sure they have the right spot on the team, but letting them figure it out for themselves. And man, college recruiting, that is a whole nother uh, ball of wax that I do not envy anyone going through that. So it, it's, it's been a challenge, it's an interesting, I've been in a lot of cool places in the country with both of them and, um, they're great athletes. I'm really lucky that they have those skills and it's been a big part of their life and their lives. And um, my daughter's playing for school, for college, and that's really exciting. Their season was canceled now, but hopefully they play again or wait till next year. But it's, it's a big part of who they are and who we all are as a family. Representative Tina Polsky, you're running